Um, when you study muscles, there's many levels of knowledge that you have to know. Uh, the most basic level of knowledge is identification. Can you ID the muscle? In other words, can you name it? We got plenty of muscle models. We have torsos all over the room. There's two torsos back there. There's two like little men standing on the desk. They're going like this. Two of them. Study those. Uh, we got arms and legs over here. We'll, we'll study the arm, right? We're doing upper limb. So there's plenty of models that have the muscle. I always just kind of put a little piece of tape on it and just name it. Okay? Muscles are named for different reasons. They're named for their shape or they attach, their action. And, well, each muscle that I go through, I'll tell you why it got its name. Okay, that'll help you remember the name. Um, so the whole function of muscles is that most of them attach to the skeleton and move joints. So you have to know their attachments. That's another level of organization. And so um, we usually teach muscles as a have, having two basic kinds of attachments to the skeleton, um, or, origin and insertion. For origin, I'll just kind of put O and then list it. The origin is the attachment to a bone that, in that particular movement, it, it's not moving. Attachment to bone, not moving. So that the other attachment we call the insertion. I'll just put an I for insertion. That's the attachment to the bone moving. And so if something is moving, you have to be able to think about <clears throat> what joint is moving, what region is moving, what, what the movement is. So another level of knowledge is the, the action or the function, muscle action. I mean, it's the function of the muscle. So I use those terms interchangeably. Books use either term. What they mean is how is the muscle moving the, the body? And so what you, an appropriate way to name it, to give you an example, is um, you have to say, uh, let's say, flex elbow. And all movements are listed according to the anatomical position, which is your first test. And the skeleton's in the anatomical position, right? The hands, palms face forward, uh, gaze is forward, feet close together, okay? So if you flex elbow, you should know what flex means. I did define those movements before. You should know where your elbow is, right? Flex elbow. The other way you could say that is you could say flex forearm. That's a different way of saying the same thing. The first way, you're naming the joint that's moving. That, that's acceptable. The other way, you're, you're naming the region that's moving. The forearm is the region between the elbow and the wrist. So it's the forearm that you're moving. Okay, so you know, you know, think about that when you have to like name the function of a muscle, not just naming the muscle, name its function. That's another level of organization. And the last level of organization is innervation. I mean, the last level of knowledge, innervation. Okay, that, that's the nerve that innervates the muscle. So when the nerve fires, it makes the muscle contract. Because muscles do one thing, they pull, they never push. Nerve. that innervates a muscle. Okay. When we talked about nerves, we talked about all different kinds of nerves, motor, sensory, somatic, and visceral. So if you're a nerve that innervates a skeletal muscle and makes it contract, that is somatic motor function, right? So we have to know the nerves that provide somatic motor function.
Now today, um, in the next couple few days, as I go through muscles, I don't know exactly how long it's going to take me to get through all of them, but um, I'll present the top three, and I'll present innervation as its own lecture when I present the brachial plexus. That's the last lecture of this unit, if you follow the schedule. Okay. I would say the thing that gives um, students the most headache, is if I, if I had to pick one, is attachments. Okay. However, attachments are extremely important to learn and commit to memory. Because if you know attachments, it makes function a lot easier. Okay. A lot of students like to use flashcards to study muscles, and I think that's okay. Uh, the one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to like just try to brute force memorize it. <coughs> you can pull it off, but it just makes um, it makes it a lot easier if you understand concepts behind these facts um, as opposed to just memorizing facts. So let, let me show you what I mean by that. Um, if one knows a muscle's attachments, you can deduce the muscle's actions. So for example, let's say, let me draw a little um, example of what I mean there. So I got my little shoulder joint here. Well, let's pretend you got a muscle. Okay, uh, I know there's a muscle that goes from, let's say here, Attaches there, where I drew a little red squiggly line, and it goes to there. So I know that. I know its attachments. I don't even know what the muscle is, but I know its attachments, those two, those two spots. And let's say I know this is the origin, this is the insertion. And I know muscles do one thing. They pull, they never push. This muscle happens to go that I'm studying, let's say, here to here. It's like, uh, it's a muscle. Okay, I know muscles pull, they never push. I know it's pulling from the outside mid shaft of this bone. It's going to pull that way. Oh, hmm, what is that? Oh, that's abduction. I know from this these attachments, this muscle, without even naming it, is an abductor, abduct shoulder. <coughs> That means you, you pull the arm out in the frontal plane, right? Does that make sense? I, I knew where it attaches. Okay, I can figure it out. I mean, it, the inverse is true. The inverse is true. Uh, what I mean is, if you know the muscle's actions, you can deduce its attachments. If you know a muscle's uh, action, you can deduce its um, <clears throat> attachments. Before I said, if you know the muscles' attachments, you can figure out its actions. This one is so, okay, attaches here and there. I know it, it would abduct. Let's say you know a particular muscle is an adductor at the shoulder. So you know that. I know it's, I know it uh, adducts shoulder. 
pull, if I know that, an adductor means you pull it in towards the body. So you must pull on the humerus from the inside somewhere. Okay. So it means you probably, like for example, maybe you have an attachment here. And maybe you insert here. Okay, and you go. So you pull from the other side of the bone and you pull this way. That will be abduction, adduction at the shoulder. Or the other one thing I could have said is, I could have said abduct arm, or I could have said um, a adduct arm. Remember, you name the joint that's moving or the region. This region is the arm, the brachium. The joint is the shoulder. Okay. It turns out, I, I, this is a real muscle, deltoid, and that's Terry's major, we'll, we'll get to him. But the point is, um, go ahead and brute force memorize everything. It'll be much more miserable for you. I, I suggest memorize understanding the attachments and, and how, how one fact let you jog your memory on the other fact. Okay. Make the facts easier to memorize. Okay. That's what I'm suggesting. You should do what I say. <laughs> I, I have a shirt. Which a student got me a shirt. It actually says, do exactly what your anatomy professor says. You know, something like that. Uh, that. That one you should do, because muscles can be a real headache if you don't try to make it easy for yourself. So I have the muscles categorized in different regions based on how they move different joints. The first category is um, a group of muscles that e either move or stabilize uh, the scapula. focus on how, move, how, how the scapula can move. Um, you can shrug your shoulders like this. That's the elevation of the scapula. You can kind of move your shoulders down, like if you're holding a heavy barbell and it kind of makes your scapula depress. You can depress your scapula, go down a little bit. You can, you can make the, the scapula slide forward a little bit. Let me not get Mr. Skeleton out here. Okay. And there I'm the skeleton. You're scapping on, on the back, right? And they sit right on top of the rib cage. If the scapula kind of slides forward, okay, if they both kind of slide forward, like, for example, when a boxer goes for the knockout punch, they kind of go like that. You make the whole scapula slide forward um, as like when you push. That movement is called protraction of the scapula. <coughs> if your mom says, stop slouching, stand up straight, you throw your shoulders back like at military attention, you know, to, uh, um, you can retract the scapula. So, you know, those are some basic movements of the scapula. Sometimes you just want to hold the scapula in place, like if you're holding up some kind of plank position, like in your gym class or something, and to keep the, the scapula from popping off your back, the muscles that attach there are just tense on all sides to just stabilize it so it doesn't move. So they're muscles that are, that are stabilizers. So those are the kinds of things I'll, I'll say when I talk about the muscles that attach to the scapula. Because that's what all of these muscles have in common. They're, they're going to have some kind of attachment to the scapula. So the first muscle is trapezius. Let's go to the back side. We'll throw on all the muscle layers there. <coughs> 
there are seven layers of muscle. For those of you that use the app, a layer means the first layer is the deepest layer. So as you layer on top, the seventh layer, what's the opposite of deep? Superficial. So we're starting with the superficial muscle. It's skin deep. You remove the skin, sub Q, you see this muscle. It's uh, trapezius. I'll, I'll highlight the entire trapezius muscle on the left side. Highlight it there. If you turn your head sideways, it looks like a trapezoid. So this muscle is named for its shape. And as I go through these muscles, uh, to be clear, for the lab practical, and by the way, when is your lab practical? Okay, you're probably right. I haven't checked the skills in a while. <laughs> but you guys are pretty aware of it. And that's coming up, right? So as I start to give lab time from here until then, start to think about going back and studying previous material, like vertebral column, spinal cord, upper limb bones. Don't let that get stale, okay? Take it upon yourself to be a self-starter. Study the stuff when you have your lab time, okay? Um, <coughs> you'll thank me later if you do that. Okay, so this muscle is named for its shape. Um, and for the lab practical, for muscles, You're responsible for ID only. Just name the muscle. All the other things I said, attachments, actions, innervations, that will be for the lecture exam. So try and compartmentalize in that way. Okay. ID only. I'll have a piece of tape on the muscle. I'll just say ID. Identify muscle. Uh, okay, so trapezius mean for its shape. Um, let's start to think about this. It's a pretty broad muscle. And there's different parts. This top part here, right here, okay, there we go. It's the descending part of trapezius. Okay. Again, let me highlight the whole thing and isolate it. So looking at the whole muscle, it's a pretty broad, broad muscle. What I like about the isolation feature of the app, it shows you the whole muscle and which parts of the skeleton it's attached to. So, um, do you see how it's attached to the scapula? Yeah, that's pretty obvious. Well, I see the scapula, it's right here. And do you see how medially it's attached all the way up and down the spine? Okay. And in whatever book or app you're using, they list all the muscle facts somewhere close. Um, for example, the origin is the external occipital protuberance and um, spinous process of C7 to T12 vertebra. And that's what you see pictured there. So let me list that on the board for this muscle's origin. External occipital protuberance Now that is a surface feature on your skull. So if you want to look that up, uh, please do. Just go to the skull chapter and um, look up external osseo protuberance. If you feel um, a bump on the back of your head, that's it. And this muscle attaches all the way up there. It's one of the <coughs> origins. But then it attaches to um, spinous processes. C7 and T12. So all the way up and down your spine. Okay, That's where it originates from. Then it goes out laterally and attaches to different parts of the clavicle as well as the scapula. So they picture the clavicle there. So let me go back to the full body view and just highlight this top part. They call this the descending part of trapezius because the fibers descend from up to the head and uh, down to the clavicle scapula. 
Let me hide this muscle. It's a little bit in the way. So I'm going to zoom in, and I'm showing you where the descending part of trapezius Showing you where the descending part of trapezius inserts. It grabs the lateral part of the clavicle right here, and also that is um, a chromium right there. So the descending part inserts on lateral clavicle as well as a part of a chromium. So imagine these fibers descend down. When they pull, they're going to pull up so they can help elevate the scapula. Let me show that to you. So let's look at it from the posterior view. I think it's pretty obvious. You're shrugging your shoulders, right? You're elevating uh, the scapula. And if you use the app, uh, you know, um, the muscle lights up when the action you're, you're talking about is executed, okay? And you can feel on your own body if you did it, it as you elevate your shoulder, you can, you can feel some tension uh, develop. So that's that part of the muscle. Okay, let me stop, go back. Um, this middle part, this the part where the fibers run transversely in the transverse plane, right? Horizontal is the transverse plane. That is the transverse part of trapezius. And so this muscle, you're going to have to look where I put the sticker because there's three different parts. There's descending, transverse, and ascending, as I'll get to. Well, anyways, this part it reaches out and it's going to grab <coughs> this is where it's inserted okay that's a chromium way out there but as you go more medial that is spina scapula so that's where it's inserting so it Inserts chromium scapular spine. So this is right on the back side. Okay. So it's pulling from the back. So it's gonna retract your shoulder. That's the main action there. So here's how you demonstrate shoulder retraction there. They flex the arm first. You don't, that's not really what I'm talking about. When the muscle lights up, that's what I'm talking about. See how it kind of like slides backwards a little bit? That is retraction of the scapula. So the descending part did the elevation. Elevate scapula. Uh, this part is retract scapula. the uh, ascending fibers. The ascending fibers go up and when they go up they grab that medial part of scapular spine and so they're gonna help um, pull the, the shoulder down a little bit because they're coming up and then they pull down. So the muscle lights up during scapular depression. So I'm gonna continue up here I'm sorry, what? What allows you to pin your shoulders back? Is that more of a trend? Like when you're like straightening up? Well, this makes you which, um, pull your shoulders down. So, so you're saying which makes you pull your shoulders back? Yeah, like. That, that's this one. 
Okay, it's that one. Yeah. Okay. Trying to respond. Like military attention. Okay. okay, so yeah, descending trend. Yeah. Ascending. So the ascending part of traps is it inserts on scapular spine as well. And it will depress. The other thing I like uh, is you kind of use the app. I think most of you do use it. Uh, you can actually just kind of go on the. Um, muscle has origin insertion features. When it colors it red and blue, blue tends to be an insertion. You can just tap on it. And it says, oh, insertion of transverse part of trapezius, right? For that blue part. Now, now it's pink. That's insertion of descending part of trapezius. I, I didn't really use that feature as I presented it, but you could if you're studying. That little strip there, that's what I just presented. Well, that's the ascending part inserting right there. Okay, and you go to the uh, origins in, there's a lot of things that originate here. I should tap on one of them. Uh, let's see if I can. Well, you, you get the idea. You can play around with that. They call it the OI map. Right, any questions on a trapezius? Uh, any other questions? That's a big muscle, there's a lot of parts. So, rhomboids is two muscles, it's major and minor. So, I'm going to throw all the layers on and you can't see them. You have to remove a layer to see the rhomboids. And so those rhomboids, major and minor, they're on both sides. That's, they look like the sergeant stripes. Uh, that's rhomboid minor, and it's superior to the major. Ma minors are usually superior as a general rule. originates from C7 and T1, and the major originates from T2 to T5 spinous processes. So uh, let me write that down. So rhomboid is the derivation of the word rhombus. It's a four-sided shape. So the muscle is named for its shape. Rhomboids minor originates uh, <coughs> C7, T1, spinous processes. The major it originates <coughs> let's see, T2 to T5 spinous processes. They both go out and they insert on the medial border of uh, the scapula. So they both insert <coughs> medial border of scapula. So just look at the muscle. It's going to pull the scapula. The main, the main motion 
is retraction. Okay. Now they kind of cover the muscle with trapezius when they animate the action. But if you look closely enough, you can see a little tip of rhomboids major uh, right there. It's hiding there. But the point is, I want you to know that this muscle, when it contracts, it retracts the scapula. Uh, the next muscle that also attaches to the scapula on the medial border is the serratus anterior. So go to your tickle zone. <coughs> if you kind of like extend out, you know, the tickle zone is right in the ax axillary region, right on the rib cage, next to your armpit or the axillary region, is this muscle there. Let me isolate it. It's called serratus anterior. It's all along the rib cage there. This muscle is named for its appearance, like a serrated knife. Do you see how you have all these ser serrated appearance of these like little, they call them fleshy slips? It would appear ser serrated. So named for its appearance. Appears serrated. Okay, anterior is a <coughs> relative term. So whenever you see a relative term, like for example, what's the opposite of anterior? Posterior. posterior. You know, there's a serratus posterior superior. There's a serratus posterior inferior. You don't have to know them. <laughs> Just know that you have to know the anterior one. Okay. Well, anyways, <clears throat> so a muscle that's named for its appearance, basically. Now, as you can see from how I have it here, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the origin ribs. One to nine. Go ahead and count. It's rib one to nine. Count if you want. It, it reaches over. It's going to insert on the medial border of the scapula. I'm kind of zooming in there. Uh, the 3D app has allowed me to view this muscle much better. You can kind of through the rib cage, right? And there's the, there's the serratus originating there, and it's reaching back. And it's going to attach all along the medial border of your scapula. So this is more in front, and this is going posterior. So when these contract, it's going to pull the scap. It's going to slide it along the rib cage forward <coughs> for protraction. So it inserts medial border of scapula. So the main action is protracts scapula. Okay, let me show you how the app animates that. Protraction. So they're going to flex the arm. Don't disregard that. Right there. When the muscle lights up, the shoulder blade kind of slides forward a little bit. Okay, they call this the boxer's muscle. Like I said before, when you go for the knockout punch, you, you protract. <clears throat> okay, that's protract scapula. That's serratus. So let me move on. Rib cage muscle. Um, another muscle that attaches to the scapula is pectoralis minor. Um, okay, let's go to the front. 
got it right here. There's peck major. Remember, minors are superior. If I throw peck major over it um, and hide, hide platysma, well, it's hard to see. Let me just get rid of it. Okay, there it is. The peck minor, let me isolate it. There you go. You can see where it begins and ends. So again, this muscle is named for the region it's located. The pectoral region is basically your chest right here. Named for the region. It's located in, and then minor. Minor is a relative term. There's major that you have to know. Pectoral is major. Um, minor is a smaller muscle, and there usually some aspect of it is superior to the major. Okay, so this muscle originates on ribs three to five. That's what you see there. And it inserts on the coracoid process That's at the scapula. So, on one of your quizzes this morning, coracoid. <coughs> There's some words in anatomy that sound similar, so let me, um, let me throw this at you so you don't get confused. There's, there's coracoid, there's conoid, and there's coronoid. I gave you all of those terms on your study list. So don't confuse them. The coracoid, that's scapula. What's conoid? Process. That's clavicle. And coronoid process, that was like a little thing on the ulna. Okay, so those are all different bones. Oh, anyways, okay, the coracoid process, if you insert there, you start from like ribs three, three to five, a little bit lower, you can pull the scapula down. So the main action of this muscle is scapular Depression. <clears throat> there it is. Just pull the scapula down just a little bit. <clears throat> scapular depression. So that um, ends this category of muscles. The next muscle group are muscles that move or stabilize the arm, the shoulder joint. Let's remember the anatomy word for arm is brachium. That's the region we're moving. <coughs> Move your arm. Move your brachium. The region between shoulder and elbow. So this is moving at the shoulder to move your arm. And uh, I have deltoid listed first on the study guide. So let me list them more, draw on all the layers. Um, to highlight the entire shoulder and isolate it, it's a big shoulder cap muscle there. Uh, let me um, hi highlight just the deltoid. There we go. There's a lateral view of deltoid. Looks like an upside down triangle. So this muscle is named for its shape. Delta is a triangle shape. Like an 
upside down triangle, more or less. It's the sign for delta. And uh, what's a big muscle? It goes all the way from the front, all the way to the back. Here's front, here's lateral, here's posterior. So this muscle has three parts. Uh, and they all do different things. If you just highlight the first part, I'm going to hide platysma. If I just highlight the, the first part, that's called the clavicular part because as you can see, it's, well, I don't know if you can see it, I can see it, it's attached to the clavicle right there. That's the origin. So call this the clavicular part. of deltoid, um, that origin is, I'd call that lateral clavicle. So let me do the origins first and I'll do the insertion and action. So that's the front part. Okay, so this lateral part it's attached mostly to the acromion. That's the origin. So they call this the acromial part, laterally, originates from acromion. And if you go posterior, it's attached to the scapular spine. There it is, the posterior part. That's the spine of the scapula that it's attached to. So call it the spinal part. So another muscle where you gotta pay attention to where, I'll put the piece of tape, front, back, or lateral, so for each part there. So spinal part originates on, well, <coughs> spine of scap, scapula. Now all of these different parts, they converge onto the uh, deltoid tuberosity. The deltoid tuberosity. It's a little tuberosity on the uh, mid shaft of the humerus. I'll insert on deltoid tuberosity. For the most part, you can see why we teach bones before muscles, right? I teach the surface features because those are most of the things where the muscles attach to. And uh, well, depending on the function, well, the function depends on which part you're talking about. If you're in the front, if you're the part of the deltoid that's on the front, your main function is arm flexion. Arm, that, that's the main action. Just move the arm forward. Because you're, you're in the front, so you're, you're pulling from the front. So you flex R. Flex R. Or you could say flex shoulder. Different way of saying the same thing. That works delts. So the. Um, <coughs> Well, let me, let me give you a minor action for that, too. This can also medially rotate arm. So let me pull back a little bit. See how the hand turns in a little bit? That's, you're rotating at the shoulder. So the joint that's moving is shoulder. So this muscle can medially rotate the shoulder. Okay. So imagine if my elbow was flexed and I like move my arm in, that's, you're merely rotating at this joint. <laughs> so 
So immediately rotate arm or shoulder is another action. <coughs> The lateral part, its primary function is abduction, abduction. Okay. Abduct. I always capitalize, or not always, but sometimes I'll capitalize AB so you don't confuse AB duction with AD duction. It's main action there. And if you go posterior, let's see the main action there is lateral rotation and extension. Well, let's do lateral rotation first. You turn your arm out a little bit so you're lateral opposed to medial. Medial means you're rotating it in, lateral means you're rotating it out externally. Sometimes people call medial rotation internal rotation, uh, same thing. Internally rotate. This one we're calling laterally, la lateral rotation. Shoulder. If you want to call lateral external rotation, that's fine too. I see that a lot. But because you're pulling from the behind, um, mostly you can extend the arm. So arm extension and hyperextension, that's flexion right there. But when you bring the arm back, that's extension. When you bring it back further like that, that's hyperextension. So once again, that's flexion, but this muscle can extend and then hyperextend. So the spinal part can also extend, hyperextend, shoulder. Questions on deltoid, another three part muscle. Okay, let me move on then. Uh, oh, rotator cuff, okay. Rotator cuff is next. I'm going to D layer a little bit. What I'll do is I'll, I'll highlight the muscles that are a group of muscles called the rotator cuff muscles that form a cuff around the head of humerus. So I'm going to go multi select. I'm going to highlight, oops, I hit it. Let me show you. Okay, so I've isolated just what I want you to see, the rotator cuff muscles. You have uh, one on the front there, and you have uh, three on the back. So this is a group of four muscles, and what they do is they form uh, a cuff around the head of humerus, holding it in the shoulder joint. So that cuff is, is all around here. Here's one on the front. There's a second one, <coughs> third one. There's a fourth one back there.
Huh. The most common one? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, there are four of them. I'm not sure which one would tear first. <clears throat> Yeah, usually when they report these, like when they watch sports, they say, oh, a tore a rotator cuff. They don't specify which one. Uh, yeah, I have to look that up. Okay, well, anyways, uh, let me um, do this. Let me hide others. Let me use the pen function here. I'm going to draw it. S I T S. Uh, sometimes they call these the sits muscles. Which is an acronym for the, the muscle names. Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, subscapularis. So that first S is supraspinatus. Here's supraspinatus, let me just isolate it. The supraspinatus originates in the supraspinous fossa. Remember, that's that space in um, the scapula that's superior to the spine. So to help you remember, why is it called supraspinous fossa? That's the spine, this is superior to it. Supraspinous fossa, the muscle attaches all along there. It's gonna insert on the greater tubercle or tuberosity. It's insert, okay, that's a I, not a one, it inserts. Greater tubercle. Some books call it the greater tuberosity, but either or is fine. I, I've seen both. It's, either is acceptable. So the muscle is a little bigger below the spine. That's the infraspinous fossa. That, so that, um, I'm sorry, it's the infraspinatus muscle. It originates in the infraspinous fossa. So let me write that down. Infraspinatus. the eye, the infraspinatus, infraspinous fossa is where it originates. <clears throat> also inserts part of the greater tubercle. So this one, this one, greater tubercle. That small muscle below this one is called the teres minor. I'm isolated. Teres minor. Teres minor. So that's the name of the muscle. Now the first two, the supra and the infraspinatus, those muscle names, well I don't know if you figured it out, they're named for their location relative to the scapular spine, right? Look 
location relative to spine supra infra spinatus, and they they originate in those same name fossa, right? So the teres minor is named for its shape. Teres means round. It's, it's kind of a cylindrically shaped muscle. Named for its shape. Teres means round. And you got that relative term. So what's its antonym? Not minor, but major. There's a teres major. We'll get to it. This is the minor. Minors are superior. So teres minor originates. We call that lateral border scapula. It's also going to insert greater tubercle. So all three of those insert on the greater tubercle. So the last muscle of the set is in front. It's the subscapularis. So I have it highlighted. Let's look at it from the posterior view. Can you see it from the posterior view, yes or no? No, can't see it. It's sub, it's underneath, right? Sub scapularis. So let me isolate it. Here it is. It's called sub scapularis because on the posterior view, you can see the scapula, but you can't see this muscle. It's on the underneath side, which is the anterior aspect. Sub scapularis muscle. So that's our last T and our last S, and this one is originating on the subscapular fossa. <coughs> and, and um, well, this originates on the subscapular fossa, but it inserts on the lesser tubercle. In terms of the, the actions of this group, they, they can move the shoulder joint. However, in my opinion, their function is more for stabilization, not movement. So I pretty much just say for this group, their, their function is um, stabilized shoulder. They hold the head of the humerus in that socket a little better. Uh, someone asked about, uh, uh, Lindsay asked about tearing it, and there's a little uh, thing about tear, tear and repair. The torn rotator cuff muscle is the supraspinatus muscle. Oh, there it is. Small incisions are made to allow arthroscopic investigation of the damaged region and to allow the instruments to access the region. The damaged tissue surrounding the tear is removed, and frayed edges are trimmed and cleared. Holes are drilled and suture anchors <coughs> are embedded in the bone at the natural attachment site of the tendon. Sutures are brought through the tendon and are fixed to the anchor sites. Shoulder incisions are then sutured. Oh, 
the muscle? Like, like they're pulling the muscle down, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, well, we're a tour. Usually, when you do surgery and pull it back, when you bring the tissues close together, you allow them to heal. Okay. Like you said, repair. Okay. Regenerate. Okay. Yeah. Okay. As long as there's blood, there's blood supply, right? Yeah, yeah. These tissues should regenerate. Okay. Probably with some scar tissue, but. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I learned something. Yeah, it's on the app. The supraspinatus is the most commonly worn tour. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. You know, it's baseball season, so pitchers commonly tear those muscles. You, it makes sense, right? You've never <coughs> thrown a ball hard. Go home, take a tennis ball, throw it against the wall as hard as you can 20 times and see how your arm feels. You'll be tired, okay? Um, you can see why these muscles get torn. Another common injury for baseball pitchers, they always pull their external abdominal oblique. Now, why would that be? It's way down there. Remember the uh, serratus anterior? There's external abdominal oblique. You see how it's interdigitated with the uh, serratus anterior? Let, let me hide that. Hide here. You see how external abdominal oblique and serratus, they're kind of like intertwined? And serratus, you're whipping your arm around and the serratus is going to like really contract and pull, it might kind of like strain that. <clears throat> so anyway, that, that's a side note. But anyways, okay, what's the next muscle? Ah, so that was like four in one shot, right? The, the rotator cuff muscles. Uh, and look back there, do you see that big head? It looks like Easter egg island or something. But see the model right next to it? That little rib cage? That has a lot of these muscles. That's a good model to study uh, during the lab time. But I'm going to move on. I just want to point out that model. It's a new model. We always get excited about our, our new toys in the lab. Here's pec major. Well, let me isolate it. When people say your pecs, they're referring to this muscle. know why it's named the pectoral region is the major muscle here. Uh, it's the one we like to show off on the beach, right? Get that beach body going. Well, anyways, I'll never have one of those. Uh, anyways, there's this company called beachbody.com and they have this thing called P90X. My wife bought it and I tried it and it's like, if I could just look like the before guy, I, I'm fine. I just get to the before guy. I'll be, that's good enough for me. I have to look like the after guy. But anyways, <coughs> things like that will really get you in shape. It takes about, I would say, three months. You'll really notice a difference in the mirror if you can stick to it. And one of these muscles, the pectoralis major muscle, if you're working out your chest, you'll see a hypertrophy of this muscle, no problem. This muscle has a lot of attachments. Um, it originates on the chest region. It inserts on the arm. This muscle has origins, clavicle, sternum, as well as the costal cartilages that are deep to here. Okay. So origin, I want to call that, what is that, medial clavicle, uh, sternum. Costal cartilages. Now that big muscle is going to converge and insert just lateral to the intertubercular groove. Okay. So how I phrase that, I say lateral lip, intertubercular groove. 
Folks might say it differently, but they mean kind of the same thing. This is, here's the groove right there. And here's the lip of the groove laterally. It's just inserting just past that. Okay. So you have to think about the joint that's being moved here. If you're attaching to the arm, you can move the arm. That's the shoulder joint, right? Can you move the elbow? No. Uh, shoulder. Shoulder is in. And uh, of course, you know, we, we think of the bench press when you work out this muscle. And what is that movement called in anatomy words? They call that transverse adduction. Uh, let me go back. Right there. That's transverse adduction right there. <clears throat> not that, not that, this. Okay. Why is it called transverse adduction? Think transverse plane. That this is movement in the transverse plane, right? This plane here. So when you bring your arm from this position in, that's adduction in the transverse plane. So I mean, when you do a bench press, that's what you're doing, right? You're also extending the elbow, but, you know. Um, the dangerous thing about doing a bench presses, this is a big muscle. And um, if you extend past the horizontal here and go all the way back there, you risk tearing this muscle. Uh, so you, you want to think about that if you're uh, lifting weights and you have a spotter. When I do bench presses, I do it on the ground. That keeps my scapula on the ground, and I can't go past the horizontal. But it's safer that way. I don't lift that much weight anyway. I always think safety first, right? You don't want to. If you tear a pec, your weightlifting days are over. The muscle can heal, but you can't press 300 pounds anymore. And so it's better to be safe than uh, sorry. That's a big muscle to tear. Just YouTube it. You'll see people tear their pecs all the time. Uh, uh, bench press, lying on your back on the ground. Yeah, as I do my presses on the ground. Okay. If you pop a tendon, that can be repaired, but if you physically tear the muscle, not the tendon, uh, that, that is very serious if you need to lifting weights. You know, this muscle can do other things besides transverse adduction. Let's think about it here. Here's medial rotation. I really like that I have the animation because I like how they highlight the muscle. It lights up when it does the action. It really shows students what it does. You see it, then do it on your own body, like right, do it. Just feel your muscles contract. It really helps you to conceptualize the action better. So so continue more actions. It can easily rotate shoulder. It can also well, let's think about the arm. Do you think it could flex or extend the arm? What do you think? Flex or extend. You're on the front. Let's see. Here's shoulder flex. It can flex the arm. When you're on the front, usually you're a flexor. Bring the arm forward. So flex, immediately rotate, uh, transverse adduction. You're moving the shoulder. Now I'm going to move on. Okay, corico brachialis. That's a small muscle. It's hard to see. I got to zoom in here. 
There's biceps brachii. I'm going to remove a layer. I'm going to remove another layer. There it is right there. Now, I'm going to isolate it. So when you look at it isolated, it's really easy to see. But try to find it on a full muscle model. Because with all the layers on, you can't see it. So remember, I had to peel away a lot of layers to see this muscle. Because, you know, students, you have, uh, believe it or not, you have trouble finding these muscles sometimes on models, so it takes time. Uh, but anyways, that's coracobrachialis. This muscle is named for its attachments. When a muscle is named for its attachments, what I've noticed over the years is that they, they put the first part for origin, then insertion. This is where it originates. This is where it inserts. Coraco refers to the coracoid process. That's where it originates. It inserts on, well, brachialis. That means arm, right? I want to say medial mid-shaft humerus for its insertion. Okay, I want to see if you can start to predict these things now. Now look where it originates and inserts. Do you think that muscle is an a deductor or, or an A B ductor? What do you think? It's pulling from the inside, it can help a duct, A deduction. That's A B A B duction. That's A deduction right there. So not that. Notice the muscle lights up when it does that. Okay, so this can also flex shoulder. So this can adduct, flex shoulder. Coracobrachialis. All right, um, then I have the lats and the teres major. I'm going to throw on all the muscle groups. There's lats. Let me isolate it. So, you know, your traps and lats, those are the main muscles at the back. So this is the one inferior to traps. Latissimus dorsi is the muscle is named for its appearance. It mean that means widest of the back. And um, what well, has a lot of attachments there. All these attachments along the spine. But that's called the thoracolumbar fascia, the white tissue, connective tissue there, and it even has a part of the iliac crest there. You need to know all of those as origins. So it originates spinous processes, uh, T7 to T12. That white fascia on the bottom is called the thoracolumbar fascia. Crest. 
Okay. That big white muscle, it converges onto one point. The, let me zoom in on it. Go to the front of the arm. I'm going to call that the medial lip of the intertubricular groove. It inserts on the arm, so it can move the arm. There's one attachment that wasn't listed here that I would like you to know. Okay, that's the scapula, highlighted in green. Do you see how the latissimus dorsi actually moves past it right here? This is actually a, a really significant attachment. Okay, I wouldn't appreciate it if I didn't see it on cadavers a lot. And so this is one of the origins. It actually attaches to the inferior angle of the scapula. inserts on inter by the intertubercular groove. This muscle can move the arm in many ways. Let's think about it. It's, a, um, it's pulling from the back. It's pulling the arm from the back. So generally speaking, if you're on the back and you're pulling your arm from the back, you can extend it. Okay, that, that's the thing that I hope makes intuitive sense to you. Uh, your shoulder extension, hyperextension. You know, that that's extension, hyperextension. So I'll say extend arm, basically. However, that's not the main action. I should have started with the main action. The main action is adduction. A, D, duction. That's this one right here. Not that. That, when you pull the arm back in. That's a deduction. That's the main action of this muscle. They call this muscle the climbing muscle for that reason. That makes sense? If you're rock climbing and you grab and then you pull your body weight up, that's, that's what you're doing. You're adducting the arm. Okay. The other action is um, it can rotate the shoulder. It can medially rotate the shoulder. Let me illustrate that. You're pulling from the back. You insert <coughs> on the, by the front of the arm. So you pull from the back. You can uh, rotate inwardly. So medially rotate arm. Extend, adduct, immediately rotate arm. Those three. Remember that trio. Because the next muscle does the same thing. I'll just kind of leave it there. Oh, let, me, let me stop this and start over. It's kind of like doing weird things. Ooh. The next muscle is the teres major. some multiple highlights here. Here's Terry's major. That's the one we're doing. I'm going to select. It's 
So remember our rule, minors are superior. Uh, so which one's that? Terry's minor. Terry's major right below and it's bigger. Okay, so see how one uh, inserts, um, that's the greater tubercle. But this one's going kind of on the front, going around to the front. Actually, I'm going to um, correct something here. In your notes, change this to floor of intertubricular groove. I think that's more accurate. Correction. Not the medial lip of intertubricular groove. Floor of intertubricular groove would be more accurate. It's right in the groove. Okay, the reason why I say that is this muscle inserts more on the medial lip. So I think that'll be a better description here. So let me isolate it. Exit the multi-select mode and go to isolate mode. So I'm giving you an anterior view. The muscle is inserting in the medial lip of intertubercular groove. So I'm going to erase this. Start over. Terry's major originates um, on the trigger around the back. You can see that it originates on the inferior angle of the scapula. Inserts <coughs> medial lip intertubercular groove. So that intertubercular groove is very important. Big R muscles attached there. The teres major, the latissimus dorsi. Pector alus major, they all insert there. So I'm going to show you that. So I'm going to zoom in there. Basically, it's hard to see with the pec major, but. There's pec major inserting by the groove, and if I rotate it and you look inwardly, you can see those other two muscles, the teres major and the latissimus dorsi, they basically almost share an insertion. Okay, so that's a very important part of the humerus where all your super big arm muscles attach to. So I left this on the board, extend on. adduct arm, immediately rotate arm. Those are the same functions or actions for this muscle as for lats. Makes sense, right? The lats and the teres major, they're kind of like inserting on the arm at the same place, and they're both starting from the back. So they do the same thing to the arm. So these are the action, also the actions of teres major and lats, latissimus dorsi. All right, that's enough muscles for one day. I'll try to finish this list next time or the time after. Uh, take a break and we come back and you, you can study, start to study the muscles on our models.